Uh, yeah, so we're back to XTP from DC, TCP, and multi-homing. And uh, more specifically, this is going to be about how we could technically compile P4 down to XTP and how to do it from a user's perspective. So this is more high-level user using XTP in some way or the other. Um, so this talk is going to be split in half. First, I'm going to talk about for the next half about what P4 is, um, what we have done, like what we have built, and how we actually test that the programs we generate work. Um, William then will walk you through an example how we actually generate XCP code from P4 and what the performance results are currently and what we currently have. We also encountered a bunch of limitations, uh, fundamental ones and mm, some technical limitations. We're also going to discuss those at the end. So in general, what is P4 actually? Um, P4 is basically a high-level programming language um, for network data planes, which means that in P4 you can describe packet processing and parsing behavior um, independent of the protocols or any other, um, <coughs> well, limit, like stack limitation. Um, it's meant to be extremely flexible and allows you to define any kind of protocol you want. And also, you're su supposed to be able to specify any type of parsing procedure you want to. Um, the way you use P4 is you compile a P4 program, and it is loaded into a target platform. Target platform means it could be a switch, uh, NPU, any kind of networking device. Um, we had, it's open and standardized, so it's tried to be as open source as possible, and anyone can use it for whatever purpose they want to. Uh, the essentials of P4 are basically, P4 is a C-like language. It's strongly typed. Uh, it's obviously a lot higher level than C, um, but it's also type and memory safe. So we, there's no pointers at all. And we also want to bound execution because you don't want to have loops in your data processing bit. Um, it's statically allocated, so there's no dynamic allocation at all. Um, we don't use any malloking or any recursion. In the same way, we want to be safe in our programs. There's a spec for P4, it's open source, um, the P4-line repo. And we also have a reference compiler, which is extensible and also open source under the Apache license. And anyone can use it and uh, compile their own backend. So how do you actually use P4 if you want to use it? Um, the assumption is that you have some kind of architecture model, which is basically a library of P4 um, functions. It um, defines basically whatever you want to use in your program. And you have a compiler that generates a binary for you. So essentially, a user would write their P4 program, which specifies uh, the way you want to parse packets, for example, Ethernet headers, IP headers, uh, PLS. And this program is then loaded into the compiler, which generates a binary for you. This binary then can be actually compiled into the target and generates the data plane for you. The data plane meaning it has all the tables, it has all the objects you want to use, and it forms your switch data plane. Um, and once that is actually done, a user can also supply their own control plane, which is it's completely flexible and open source. So everyone can define their own control plane. It's not proprietary or limited by uh, vendors. Um, once that is done, you have basically interaction between the data on control plane, which is defined, all defined by the user, and completely uh, flexible to whatever process you want to use. Um, P4 used to be just for switches, and just meant to be for switches. But uh, recently, a new standard was uh, defined, P4.16, which made P4 a lot more flexible. And now we can actually generalize to all kinds of <coughs> data planes or targets. What that means is, next to a switch, we can also write P4 code for network interface cards, uh, network processing units, or even software or operating systems. And that's where we also come to XTP itself. So how do P4 and XTP work together? Well, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with eBPF XTP by now. Um, eBPF is a virtual machine running in the kernel. What it provides is a way for you to write C code, restricted C code, and run it in the kernel. So that's actually quite nice. And 
you can use it in, on a different set of hook points, all of which define or give you different kinds of features. So XDP, eBPF, TC. So wherever you want to insert it in the stack, you have different kinds of methods you can use. Well, it's extensible, safe, and fast. Um, and it's also an alternative to user space networking. So we are we are actually using the kernel, not just DPDK and user space stacks. Well, the most interesting part about it is actually it's a programmable data plane in the kernel by now. Because you can program your own programs and you can load it into your data path. So it gives you a fast programmable data path you can use. And that is exactly what P4 is also meant for. So comparing the both, the, both languages, um, these are the features both ex exhibit. Um, whereas EPPF and XCP is low in terms of using the C language and being very specific, P4 is meant as a specification language for network language, for network parsing or processing. So it's a more high level approach. Um, both are safe, P4 by using uh, a type system um, and EPPF by using a verifier. Loops are not really possible unless you use roundabout ways, for example, using tail calls or in P4 you could just use parser loops where you just loop across headers in parse packets. In both languages you do you use static allocation and you define your policies in P4 or in EVPF you use your maps to define your policies or forwarding policies and in P4 you would also use tables. So a match action procedure where you specify, okay, I have an incoming packet, what is the action I operate on it. Well, helpers functions, um, in both languages, they're pretty much dependent on the target or the hook you use. And the control a plane API in eBPF is pretty much the maps you use. And in P4, it's generated what, whatever target you use. So based on this idea, we have built two backends um, for eBPF on the open source compiler. One that actually generates eBPF code and loads it for you using TC. And another one that generates XTP for you. Um, both of them are ex extensions of the P4 compiler and they use much of the code. Um, it's obviously not production ready yet. There's lots of work left to do. It's not fast and we have to make sure everything is correct, but it's getting there and it's evolving quite nicely. Um, so how do you actually gener generate this XTP code? So we have a specific pipeline in where we first insert a P4 program and generate our XTP C code, which is stylized C in the sense of it's a very specific preformatted C. And we don't use tail calls at all right now. Um, it has a bunch of complexity involving tail calls. We're trying to get there, but it takes a bit of time to flesh this out. All data is currently on the stack, so we generate a lot of um, variables. So our control and data plane is solely defined by these eBPF tables, which is quite nice. All the communication happens over this interface, and it's quite clean and um, well defined. Right now we can do basic filtering, basic forwarding, and some encapsulation. And we mostly use traffic controller TC for loading or forwarding packets right now. We would like to use the PPF, but um, it, we're just in the process of migrating there. So the switching model in general is a parsing stage where you parse the packet you receive and you parse each other individually and store the values. Um, on, after this parsing stage, you actually perform the action on the parse packet, um, which is defined by your control plane, which, which uh, well, it controls all the tables in your match action database. Once that is done, you have to deparse the packet, which means you put the headers back, based back on the stack and emit the packet. The general flow is you have a P4 program, you load it into your XDP compiler, it generates the C code for you, and it also loads it into the kernel to the interface you specify. In parallel, it also generates an API for you, so eBPF tables and the calls you need to actually modify these tables, and which you comp can compile with your C program or control plane C program. 
So this allows you to modify the table and update the policies on your interface or data path. But we want to actually ensure that this code we generate is correct. So we also have a full-end testing pipeline to verify that we, do, we don't do anything uh, completely insane. So we have two test frameworks, one in user space, completely in user space, and one in the kernel space, which is end-to-end -end testing. Uh, we actually use user space to just isolate the specification of our program to make sure um, that the code we generate is functionally correct and does compile nicely. It's mostly for us to verify that our code is correct, and we want to isolate it from the kernel um, shenanigans, not shenanigans, but uh, making sure that the kernel is not interfering with what we want to do right now. Um, it's basically a copy of all the kernel code, and it's a user space wrapper, and provides us with all the eBPF tables and APIs we want to use, and it's all quite simple. The nice thing about this, you can actually use simple tools uh, like GDB to just step-by-step -step walk through your program and identify what's going wrong and what, what is not working right. Um, we also do end-to-end -end testing in which we load the EVF program into the kernel and test, uh, test it on custom packets we inserted. What we do here is we create a virtual environment and attach interfaces to it and load, load EVPF programs to all the interfaces we have and test if you can actually send packets through it and if they, these ports, virtual, virtual interfaces, um, forward the packets correctly. We capture all of the, our packets using TCP dump and then verify if the output is what we expected. So in general, we have five testing stages. We first provide a P4 program and a an so-called STF file. STF files are a more, you can find out more in the papers. They are mostly just uh, test specification files which, allow, which say, okay, um, I want to insert these packets and I expect them on this output port and or on, they're going to be dropped eventually. So it's mostly a test specification language. So what we do is we compile our P4 program, we parse our SDF file. From the SDF file, we generate a bunch of input packets on each interface we want to use and also um, a list of output packets we expect on our interfaces. From the P4 program itself, we compile our runtime source code, which is the C program and a general runtime library we use, and then compile it into our actual data plane, which basically gives us the executable. We run this executable, feed the packets into it. In the kernel space, this would be a virtual environment where you just use uh, Scapy or anything like that to just write the packets to the interfaces. In user space, this is just a simple program which feeds uh, packets into its executable. We run it and we get a bunch of output packets. With that, we actually check the results and see if our expectations match what we have gotten as a result. If that is the case, we pass the program. If not, we fail. And with that, I Give to William, who's going to talk and guide you through a sample P4 XTP program. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the example code we generate and P4 program. Um, <clears throat> so this is a very simple example. So we want to write a P4 program that do basically parsing only the Ethernet header and IPv4 header. And then we look up a table using Ethernet destination MAC address as a key. And based on the table content installed by the control plan application, we can either drop the packet by returning the XDP drop or pass to the stack by returning XDP pass. And remember, we have three stage, uh, three pipelines, three stages here. Parser, match, match and action, and then the parser. So uh, users write P4 program by first specifying the protocol you are interested in. So in, the, in our case, it's only Ethernet and IPv4 headers. And then the compiler, the P4C XDB compiler, will generate the C structure like uh, this one. And so the next stage for the parser is to write a, a state machine. So from the state star, we extract the Ethernet header. 
And then based on the value of the protocol number, in this case it's IPv4, then it goes to the next stage, which is IPv4. So uh, we again can convert this P4 code into a C like uh, program below. So we have a struct headers HD, which uh, has uh, both Ethernet header and IPv4 header. And then we generate code, uh, C code that later on compile into PPF. So after the parsing stage, then it's uh, next stage is match and action. So the match and action, the P4 code first, we write a control loop. And in, the, in this function, uh, the first in out is uh, headers. The headers from the previous stage we parse. And then there's an input metadata XDP uh, input. Uh, in this case, user can define their own input metadata, or in our case, it's uh, IF index. And uh, output out, uh, this uh, returns uh, uh, the action to the, to the packet. And then we start by defining two actions. One is drop, returning XDP drop. The other is fallback, returning XDP pass. Then we have to define a table. So this table will have a key as the destination MAC address, and then it's an exact match. And the value will be either a fallback action or drop action. And also we have to specify the implementation. Here, when we say hash table, uh, then we'll use the eBPF hash map. We'll later on, a compiler will use the eBPF uh, hash map. So based on user's uh, definition in P4, we'll again generate the struct uh, struck by the, the struct in the uh, header file. So we put all these struct definition in a, a header file. In this case, it's called xdb1.h, so that the control plane API, the control plane program can, imp can just include this one, and then you, you can either use a, like libbpf or something to populate the map. Uh, so the last stage is the departure stage. So departure is when, uh, when you want to update the packet content. For example, if you update uh, IPv4 TTL, then you want to, in the end, at that stage, you want to update the packet data. So again, our compiler generate the code to do this. So first we have to use this uh, helper function called XDP adjust head. So this is in some case, people want to do a packet encapsulation or decapsulation, so that we need to move the packet uh, data point. And then we just call uh, load by or write, uh, load, load by and store by to write the data back. So <coughs> after users write this uh, three stage, the people call, actually we generate one single eBPF program. So this one single eBPF program will have three parts. So parser, uh, match and action, and deparser. So parser is very simple just to check the packet access boundary and walk through the protocol graph and then put the value in the, put the headers in the struct headers. Then we'll generate the uh, <coughs> map lookup uh, mechanism using the eBPF helper function, eBPF map lookup uh, element. And then in the departure stage, we'll write the value back. So we did some performance benchmark of uh, our generated P4 XDP program. Mm, we set up two machines. On the left-hand side, it's a packet generator. So these two machines connect together using 10 gig NICAR. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, we generate UDP packets sending 14 million packets per second. On the right-hand side, we run this uh, P4C XDP uh, code. Um, <coughs> And then we measure the packet rate to um, packet drop rate. So first we did a baseline measurement. So just a simple program returning XDP drop. So we call it simple drop. Um, it shows 14 million packet, 14 to 4 million packet per second. So basically no overhead. Then uh, we have a couple of uh, sample code. For example, XDP one we do uh, Ethernet IPv4 parsing and then drop. Uh, this uh, drop the performance uh, to 8 million packet per second. Then we do even more, we do a extra MAC table lookup uh, to look up the MAC address in the map. Uh, this is XDP3 and so it dropped a little bit. 
Then XDP6 did even more, so it does a, <coughs> a map table lookup and then get a new TTL value, write it back to the IP and recalculate the checksum. So then it drops to 2.5. Uh, the drop is pretty huge, so we did some uh, analysis and find out that the code we generate from this compiler actually uh, has two overhead. First is that we d the P4, we expect P4 users to uh, expect this, the by ordering is host by ordering. But then we have to convert it into uh, network by order and then convert it back. So there are multiple by order conversion there. And also when we are doing packet departing, uh, right now, we unconditionally uh, just write everything into the package. So sometimes the user doesn't touch the package, so we don't need to do that. So right now, if we re manually remove these uh, two overhead, then we get a little bit better performance, like 14, uh, 13, and 12 million package. But this shows that there are still some work to do in our compiler, so right now it's uh, more straightforward. Um, <coughs> some limitations. So I would say, compared with to uh, P4 and XDP, so uh, loops, uh, for the P4, loops only allow in parser. XDP, you can do tail call. For the nested headers, uh, P4 supported uh, bounded depths and also XDP. And others like multicast, uh, packet segmentation, packet reassembly, uh, queue scheduling, and linear scans are not supported in uh, P4 and XDP. Uh, for the state, uh, in the case of P4, it's using register and uh, XDP is using EPPF map. Uh, we hit some limitations here. So first, uh, for a switch, we want to do uh, multicast and broadcast. Right now, XDP doesn't support it. Also, when, we, uh, when users define a very large protocol or many protocols, uh, the stack size is too small. Right now, uh, the, li the limit is 512 bytes. And uh, in the case of testing framework, we use a lot of NAND spaces and generic XDP and sending traffic between them. Uh, we, we, we found out that I, UDP and ICMP works, but TCP somehow, because of this uh, SKB clone, uh, TCP is not, uh, is ignoring this case. Sorry, we'll fix that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we also find out that uh, under some case of, when we are using NAND spaces, we have to put everything in one command line. If we break, and then if we ping a map and then break the command into uh, many different commands, then uh, the map is, uh, is not ping, it's gone there. So uh, in conclusion, <coughs> so P4 is actually a very high level language for you to, for users to specify the data pass behavior. So this language can be generalized to different architecture. And in this talk, we are talking about the uh, Linux kernel and uh, XDP. So uh, XDP can be, <coughs> uh, so people can express XDP in a high level abstraction to C code. And uh, right now in this, uh, in this project, the general, co general code is uh, works okay, performant, but like I say, there are still uh, things to do and things to optimize. Okay, that's all my talk, thank you. Uh, is this working? Okay, Fabian, I, I don't blame you for wanting to shield yourself from Colonel shenanigans. I, in fact, encourage everyone to shield themselves from Colonel shenanigans at all times. Uh, do we have any questions for these uh, fine folks at the, up on the stage? Okay. All right, does that work? Um, I had a question. You went from P4 to C to BPF. Um, do you think that there's an advantage to go from P4 directly to BPF and skip the step from C into C? Uh, yeah, go ahead. So the question is whether, does it make sense to directly transfer from P4 to eBPF, right? Yeah. So right now we, we don't have plan to do that because it's hard to debug. Uh, the benefit of transfer, uh, translating compiled to C is that we can reuse all the tools we are building today, so, yeah. So, yeah, it's mostly about convenience because we have LLVM. Pro 
probably, I think LLVM is a bit in inefficient in its generation sometimes. I think me, I talked about this, yeah. but that's not our domain. I think one of the things you're, you're running into is that you, know, you have this nice header structure and mm -hmm. it's trying to accommodate basically anything P4 could try to yes. do. And if you get to the point where you can plane down what's in there based upon what features of P4 were actually used by the P4 program, whatever gains you think you're going to get by going directly to BPF, you might get from this simplification optimization that you could perform during the translation stage. I do agree with you that it's a lot easier to debug, and it's a lot easier to insert this stuff into your debugging and testing framework yes. because there's that intermediate C stage. Anyone else? Um, so I'm curious, uh, the deparser step where um, like one of the optimizations was um, if you can basically avoid writing the entire set of headers you know about back into the packet, then you save a lot of uh, performance. Um, do you see that as a limitation of P4 or it's like something you can do in the compiler? Like this is also exposed through the API, right? So like where's the, the line of, of what the compiler can generate more sensible code there and um, yeah, I think this is uh, something compiler can do. So as a compiler, we should take, a, we should look at the match and action. Probably we should scan users code in, uh, in the match and action stage to see whether this protocol or this uh, header is modified or not. So if it is not modified, then we can skip the, the departure stage. Uh, do you have any plans to address uh, the problem that some programs can be rejected by the kernel, for example, because the features you need are not in the particular versions, or the driver does not support XDP, and so on? Well, uh, we had that as a persistent problem that the verifier rejects whatever program we generate right now. Um, I'm, I'm, although it's supposed to be safe by P4 standards, but um, we have little control over, over that right now. And I'm not sure what we could do. Jerry, this is an evolving situation. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, yeah. that's how I'll put it. <laughs> so, so, we're kinda, so we kind of have the chicken and egg problem. Yeah. If we don't have people like these great folks trying to do really serious things with XDP, we're not gonna learn about the limitations and bugs in the verifier in XDP itself, like a TCP cloning situation, which unfortunately I've known about for quite some time, uh, we're not gonna know what we need to fix. So yeah. I think we're just gonna have to go back and forth uh, iterating like this until we get everything working properly. Yeah, so there's still a process where you have to manually edit files to pass the verifier because our code is too verbose right now or there's some, some little problem in there. So. The NTS user space testing is meant to check if the, it passes the verifier or not normally. Would it, make, would it make sense to speak into the box, please? Yeah. Would it make sense to create some kind of database of programs that are failing verifier that just well, no, those guys we, can fit? I think it's called the BPF test suite that's in the kernel right now. So. No, I mean so something that would be easy for those guys, like if they have program that doesn't pass very far and they think they're correct, just put it somewhere without <laughs> doing much effort on their side. So please put uh, pro pro programs not accepted by the verifier so that we know that we have to fix this, yeah. is what you're saying. Yeah. I guess, well, we, we really want people to just post it on NetDev or wherever BPF list discussion is taking place so that Daniel and Alexi and the other developers can look at it. So. If you want a formal way to have a place where not functioning programs can be sent to get looked at, I don't know. That's up to Dan. You come to Thursday's BPF track and talk to Daniel and Alexi about it. It's my <laughs> recommendation to you. So, so there is actually a group at VMware Research which is doing that right now. They're compiling all kinds of programs and for building a database to identify what passes the verifier and what doesn't. Um, I'm not sure what they're doing with it right now, um, but. They that could be using done. that information for nefarious purposes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so you mentioned you had a user space testing framework. Does that integrate with the verifier in any way? Do you try to emulate the verifier limits? Or? No. Uh, so it's just because um, we want to have two stages. We want to verify does P4 work, does our code compile? And then the second stage, the end-to-end -end test, kernel test, does it actually pass the verifier? So. If it doesn't pass the first stage, the user space testing, we know, okay, we actually have to fix our P4. 
Anyone else? <laughs> so I was wondering, I'm not quite sure exactly how P4 works, but there's like extensions to it as well, right? Externals or something it's called. Like how much of that are you implementing? Is it just the base P4 language? Oh, you can. Yeah, so in this project, so P4, so there's a base project called P4C, and it provides compiler uh, base uh, features. And then P4C XDP is an extension to this project, and we reuse some of the stuff there, and we also uh, create our own architecture model, which, is, uh, which maps to the XDP model uh, in this case. So, so the extension in, in P4 EBPF or P4 XDP is pretty much just the helpers in EBPF. It's all these helper functions, TC helper functions, for example, TC forward or something like that. And they're defined in the P4 architecture model. And if you compile with this P4 architecture model, these will be translated to BPF helper functions. OK, and from sort of a point of view of what you can do from the P4 language, yeah. you can, you support, is there anything you don't support? Um, de depends, I, I mean, <laughs> Not support um, is pretty general, and it, it depends all kinds of, like whenever you trap to the CPU, P4, whatever you trap to the CPU in a typical switch, P4 can do. It cannot do really scheduling or like, like packet queuing decisions or anything like that in that sense. Right, because I'm, I'm aware there's a, like, a traffic control or traffic yes. management extension in the works for P4. Yes. I was just wondering if that ties into this or. Uh, it cannot do. I don't, it can do counting right now. I don't think it can do traffic shaping or traffic control in that sense. Okay. It Anyone could be else? implemented, I think. Cool. All right, thank you very much.